And it's only just beginning, y'all. 2019 is going to be a good year to be a part of Life Church. I, I wholeheartedly recommend that you, if you don't have a place to worship and connect and grow and serve, this would be the place. Amen? Because we're about reaching, teaching, coaching, and leading people because we love Jesus Christ. And we come in here today to say, Feliz Navidad, right? Look at your neighbor and say, Merry Christmas. Amen. We're going to have fun this morning. I've already had a great morning. I appreciate uh, everything that's, that's gone on. The children, um, we like the kids here. We love children. We really believe in our soul and our inmost being that if we're going to change culture, we're going to have to work with the children. It's just the way it is. We're going to have to give them foundation, give them the scripture, show them in an experiment, experiential way that Jesus is real and that Jesus loves them. And they will find that out when people like you and me love on them in Jesus' name. I want you to know that what they did up here a little while ago, they won't ever forget that kind of stuff. And when children are learning how to worship the Lord and they see you adults standing there cheering them on and encouraging them on, ladies and gentlemen, that is making an impact. And I appreciate it. And I appreciate our children's workers. And I appreciate our nursery workers. Amen. Those are our heroes. Go ahead and cheer. They're the heroes. <laughs> they have the hardest job in the church. And I appreciate the media team. You guys are always up there and doing your job, and we just appreciate you guys, and we appreciate the online group of people, congregation that's meeting with us wherever they are today. Amen? Amen. Life Church sends you greetings, and uh, we pray that the Lord would speak to you today. Now, we believe God speaks, don't we? We believe that God speaks in a lot of different ways, and uh, for the most part, we're pretty sure that if you're going to really get to know Jesus, you're going to get to know Jesus through His Word, and we believe in His Word, and we teach and preach His Word, and today I am privileged to come to you and preach to you from Luke chapter number 2, Luke chapter number 2. Now, we're going to have the scripture on the board. Uh, also, we do have outlines, so maybe if uh, uh, Jerry and Richard back there, they're in the back, if you, or Bernie's back there, if, you, if anybody needs an outline, go ahead and put your hand up, and we'll bring them to you, and if you don't want one, don't put your hand up. See, it's real simple. We're not going to force you to do anything here today, amen? So glad to be with you this morning. I'm going to talk to you about a very familiar story that all of you have read and heard Probably if you read stuff like this during Christmas time, you've read these scriptures, and I'm pretty sure that you've heard these scriptures read uh, uh, in Christmas pageants and programs and movies, etc. And so what I want to do is extract of something that is said by the angels and work towards giving you the idea of what happens when Messiah comes into your life. Now, I want to ask you right off the bat, and you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but I'm going to ask you point blank, have you experienced a time when Messiah has come to you and changed your life? Have you been there? Have you done that? And, and, and what I want you to know is, is that when Messiah comes to you, things are different. A lot of people are talking about, I'm a Christian, but I'm just kind of like the same as everyone else in my world. Well... The truth is, Christianity is what happens when a person comes to Christ, that's the other word for Messiah, and Christ comes into their life and changes their life and redeems them from their past, forgives them of their sins, and gives them a new nature. Things are different when you come to Jesus. Too many people in the world are trying hard at religious things, trying hard to feel better about themselves or life, when the truth is, we need a Savior. Because we can't save ourselves. Somebody say amen. amen. 
I mean, I can't save myself from the things that I struggle with. Are you with me on that one? You see, every person in the room has struggles. Look at your neighbor and say, I struggle. Yeah. Some of you are going to like, yeah, you struggle. Yeah, it's really easy. Isn't it easier to point out somebody else's struggles? Amen. I mean, it's easy to look somewhere else and say, yeah, I can see what's wrong with you. But the, the, the problem we have is that I need a Savior. And I need peace in my heart and in my life. There's too many people in the world who want peace, but they want it to come to them when peace should come from them. Now you think about that. I mean, all of us can say, you know what's wrong in the world? We've got uh, disorder over there, and we've got war over there, and we've got city problems over there. We've got school problems over there. We've got work problems over there. We've got church problems. No, we don't have any church problems. Anytime you have people, you have problems. Did you notice that? The problem is we're, we're looking at the problem, and we're missing the real problem because the problem's right here. We want the world to bring us peace. But in 6,000 years of human history, it's never happened. Never. And the Jewish nation was chosen by God and going to be the instrument of God to bring the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, into the world. Isaiah said that unto us this day is born, a, a child is born, a son is given, his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. That's what's happening at Bethlehem. And after all these years, 4,000 years of history, all of a sudden, Messiah comes into the world. And when he came into the world, he brought light into the world. John says, in him was light, and the light was the life of men. We've been preaching to you about the light of Christmas. So today, I want to focus in on the light is good. The light is good. Let's look at our scripture together. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Next verse, please. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Watch this now. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. What did the angel say? They said at least two things. Glory to God in the highest highest heaven that means God's realm is higher than anything else the Bible speaks of heavens in a lot of different senses there's there's our atmosphere heaven there's space heaven and then there's the third heaven where God is and the angels were saying glory to God in the highest heaven but when Jesus was sent to the earth, it wasn't just glory to God in the highest heaven. This glory to God in the highest heaven sent the Messiah into the world to do something for folks here on the earth. And the angel said, the word is peace. Peace on earth. Did you notice that? Have you ever got a Christmas card that said peace on earth? Come on, be honest. You see, that's what the Messiah was to bring. But I want to show you exactly what's involved in that today. And I want to give you, from the scriptures, what it means to have the peace of God when you come to the light. Now, the background of the story is simply this. Caesar Augustus had determined that it was time to take a census of the people. You know, we do that here in, the, in, the, in our country. I think it's about every 10 years they take a census to count the people. Caesar Augustus did the same. Now, Caesar Augustus was not a Christian person or even a believing Jew. He was pagan. And he probably didn't even realize what he was doing, but Caesar Augustus, the emperor of the Roman Empire, was operating underneath the authority of God Almighty. 
The government had determined for everyone to go to their hometown and register, and there happens to be Joseph and Mary, and Mary is a, is a mother who is going to give birth to a son of whom there was no earthly father. You guys believe that? Well, they, were, they got the summons to go home and to register, so they had no choice but to go back to the town where Joseph was to register, which just so happens to be the town of Bethlehem. Many hundreds of years before that, the prophet had said in the Old Testament that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Isn't that interesting? See, there's a few things I can take away from that. A couple of things. First, God's kingdom is above human government. God's kingdom is the highest heaven. God is doing things, and sometimes we don't know that he's doing things because all we can see is what's in front of us here. We can see human government here. We can see people's influence here. We can see how the way of the world is going here, and we are not seeing what God is doing here. You see, no one would think that Caesar Augustus was the minister of God, but Caesar Augustus was the minister of God in that he caused a census to be coming so that Joseph would go to the place where years and years ago the prophet had said Jesus would be born. Now, I don't know about you, but that's encouraging to me. Because sometimes I don't like what I see in the world. Amen? Sometimes I don't like what I think is going on in the world. But at the same time, what I can know today is that God's kingdom is far above all of human activity. God's sovereignty is not subject to human control. And God's power is such that he uses ordinary people sometimes without their awareness. God can use anybody. I used to think years ago, I guess when I was first learning to preach, I used to think that God could only use people that were really in tune with him and that God and that were, uh, you know, hearing from, from heaven. And I always thought God has no use for any evil person and God cannot use them in any way. And that's just simply not true because as I study the New Testament, I find out that even when evil tries to act against God, God still overworks the evil and takes the evil, what evil means for bad, God intends it for good, and God still gets his stuff done. Now, everybody in here can be encouraged by that because all of you have dealt with evil this year. Oh, I'm thinking about, remember the Apostle Peter? The Apostle Peter told Jesus, said, everybody else might fall away from you, but I'll stay with you. And Jesus said something to him that probably didn't come out of how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> Jesus looked at Peter and said, you're going to mess up. Jesus looked at Peter and said, Satan desires to sift you. Now, everyone in this room would say, well, Jesus, don't let Satan sift Peter. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you think that God would just say, devil, you can't have, you can't touch any of my people? But Jesus didn't say that. You know what he said? Uh, I've prayed for you, and when you turn back, strengthen the brothers. You know what that means? That means that in the time that Peter was going to deal with the enemy, Peter was going to learn something. And when Peter came through that time, Peter was going to be able to come back and encourage people like you and me. Wow. You see, most of us think when things are going bad, we think God's left us, and God's not there and God's failing us and all that kind of stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, God knows where you are. God knows what's going on with you. And it's not over. The, the whole thing is, is that God is teaching something to you that you need to learn. God sees something in your life that you can't see. And through the difficulty, you're going to grow through it. And when it's over, you're going to look back on it and say, God, you were good and God, you were faithful. God's power is above human control. Now, let's talk about the light. The shepherds are here, and all of a sudden, they saw the light. They saw the brilliance and the glory of the Lord in these angels, and the light was scary. Every time in the Bible, when you read about an angel appearing to somebody, somebody's afraid, don't you think? Uh, if you saw an angel right now, you'd be a little nervous. It's just true. If you saw what is real, 
you'd be, at first glance, you'd be afraid because God and his glory is so radically different than us. And so when the, the angels came, the first thing that happened was the shepherds were afraid. But I want you to know the light is scary, but the light also has a voice. Out of this light, they began to speak. You see, some people are afraid of the light of Jesus Christ. A lot of people are afraid to go to church because they don't want to be around God. Some people uh, are afraid of God because they think God is uh, existing in the world just to kind of kick us around and, and punish us. And God is disappointed in us. And people think I'm too sinful and I cannot come before God. And someone says, why don't you come to church? And right off the bat, it's scary. I want you to know that it is scary to be in sin and to approach a holy God. But ladies and gentlemen, just like Jesus said many times, and just like the Bible says many times, and just like the angel said, the, the light has a voice, and the light says, don't be afraid. You see, you might be scared to death about what God might speak to you today, and you might be listening to the Word of God, and you might feel guilty today, and you might feel like, I have, I have radically messed up my life, and you might feel like, I just don't know if there is a tomorrow, and God is so disappointed in me, and God's going to punish me, and God is angry with me. I want to tell you in the name of Jesus that God is saying to you today, don't be afraid. Amen. You see, the light is good because the light is a Savior. The Bible says today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Messiah, the Lord. What do you think a Savior is? <laughs> Have you ever been in a water and you thought you was going down for the last time? And somebody gets you out of there, somebody saved you from the water. You see, some people misunderstand what a Savior is. They think all a Savior does is get my ticket punched so when I die, I go to heaven and I miss hell. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus didn't just save us from hell. Jesus saved us from our sin. Jesus saves us from ourself. Jesus saves us from our past. He saves us for, from our present. He saves us from the dumb things we keep doing and can't stop doing. He comes in and when he saves us, he radically saves us. He overwhelmingly saves us and he changes us because that's just who he is. He lived the life that we never could so that now we can live the life that he lived. Ladies and gentlemen, that is real Christianity. And in that real Christianity, there's no reason to be afraid. See, the light is shining today. You guys heard the music today. You saw the children praising the Lord today. That's light. You saw the worship team singing and praising the Lord. That's light. We have read the scriptures today. That's light. The, the preaching of the word of God is, is the light of God. The Bible says that God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save people who believe. You are in a place right now where the word of God is being preached and declared and proclaimed. Ladies and gentlemen, the light is here. And the light is good. And three things I want you to know about the light. First of all, the light has purpose. The light brings purpose purpose to your life. Do you know the purpose of your life? Why are you alive? Are you an accident? Did you just happen to show up? Or is there some bigger purpose in mind? Can I ask you something? How many of you believe that you were created by God Almighty? Do you believe that you're not an accident? I mean, the enemy would tell you that you should have never been born, and sometimes we feel like maybe that's the truth, but that's a lie straight out of hell. That sounds like the enemy. Ladies and gentlemen, you were created by God and for God. And when the light came to the shepherds, I want you to know that these men, they were just ordinary people. Ordinary shepherds. And in this time of, of, of uh, history, Shepherds were not considered to be the ones that had everything. They were not the rabbis. They were not the teachers. They were not even looked well upon in many circles. Ladies and gentlemen, many times the shepherds were considered to be nothing more than peasants. 
We might even say in this story that they were nobodies. They were just ordinary people living an ordinary life, and one day the extraordinary happened. That's us today. You might say, I don't have very much of an extraordinary life. I'm just an ordinary person with an ordinary job, an ordinary family, ordinary relationships. And you might think I'm just going through life as an ordinary person, and at the end of it all, my ordinary life is just simply existing, and I don't even know why I'm here. That is exactly who the shepherds were until the light shone. And I want to say to you today that you might feel that way today, but I want you to know the light is shining, and the light has a voice, and the voice came to the shepherds and say, I've got some good news. And to you today, we've got good news. The light brings purpose. See, after they worked through their extreme fear, you know what they said? The scripture says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. You know what happened? These ordinary people all of a sudden had some brand new priorities in their life. You see, that's what happens when you find Jesus Christ. That's what happens when Messiah comes to your life. You all of a sudden realize that life is much bigger than ordinary. And there is a God in heaven. And this God loves me. And this God is not in to bringing fear to me, but to bring me to a right relationship to himself. And these shepherds said, I'm going to go find out. Let me ask you something. Are you tired of the mundane existence of just going through the same old, same old ruts of life? If so, I've got good news. There's a Savior for that. And now what I'm asking you to do is to make it a priority in your life. Let's go find him. Let's go see where he is. You see, a lot of people are like, I, I'm a Christian, but I, I don't have much to do with church or Bible or prayer. And I'm like, I don't get that. Because if you saw what the shepherds saw, you'd be looking for what the shepherds were told about. And if you ever see the light of Jesus Christ, you will do some different things. The Bible says when someone comes to Jesus, old things are passed away. Amen. And all things are becoming new. Thank God, because those old things are mundane. Those old things are ordinary. Those old things are depressing. Praise God, I don't want to live in depressed religion. I want to live with the joy and the peace and the glory that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. How about you? The light brings purpose. Point two, the light brings peace. We talked about that at the beginning of the message. I mean, how elusive is peace today? I don't know if there'd be anyone here that would say, I love conflict. There might be one or two weird persons. <laughs> I've known a few. I've known a few that were really happy when they could be unhappy. In fact, I've pastored a long time. I've known a lot of people that way. You know, you don't want to ask them how they're doing because they're going to tell you <laughs> for the next 20 minutes. How elusive is peace? I mean, is there anybody in here that say, you know what, in my marriage, I love it when we quarrel? Is there anybody here that would say, I love it when everyone's mad at everybody on the job? I think it's great to go to Christmas dinner with people that I can't stand. Yeah, some of you are grinning. You've probably been there, haven't you? And you think, why in the world does this conflict just happen over and over and over? And You know, you really have to have something wrong with your thinking to think that's what the way you want to live. And we live in a world where it seems like there's always drama going on. Somebody say amen. <laughs> a 
But the problem we always have is we never tend to think those things are our fault. <laughs> I go to Christmas dinner with people that I can't stand, and I think, I don't like, I don't like these people. Well, maybe you're the one with the bad attitude. Sometimes you might say, well, try living with my spouse. Now, I would say try living with yourself. Amen. I mean, how would you like to be married to you? Some of you wouldn't last one day. Amen. I've pastored churches before where the churches got divided. And I want to tell you, if you want to see something that looks like hell on earth, a divided church is exactly that. A divided marriage is exactly that. I want to tell you something. Can I just get off on that for just a second? Marriage today is so under attack. And I, I'm telling you, I am so radical about being an advocate for marriage because the devil has made the idea of marriage an afterthought today. It's like we just jump in, and as soon as we don't feel in love anymore, we jump out. C.S. Lewis addressed that. He said, and he was a bachelor at the time he wrote it, but he, he addressed it. He said, most people get married, they make a promise when they're in love. They feel a certain way. But then as time progresses, the euphoria of the in love tends to wane. It doesn't stay like that all the time. All of you married folks know what I'm talking about, right? It just doesn't, you can't. I'm sorry, Hollywood's got it wrong. You can't live there all, all your life. So what happens is you come down here, and he says, when you don't have the in love feeling, then what you need is to do what the Bible says and love your spouse. But we just don't do that now. Because when we feel an in love, we make a promise that we're going to love, and as soon as we fe don't feel like we're in love, we forget the promise. So why make the promise? You might as well promise to never have a headache again. You're going to feel certain things at certain times. But if you're going to make it, you're going to have to have the biblical concept of loving your spouse. And if you can do that, you can bring the joy of the Lord to your marriage. You can make it. The only reason you can't make it is because there's some type of insecurity or, or uh, immaturity in your life. Relationships break up because of self-centeredness. Guys, I want to tell you, you younger folks, before you get married, think about the character of the person you're about to marry because you're going to spend your life with them. And at some point you might be going, I think I got the wrong deal. You know how many times that people come to me in marriage counseling and say, I think I married the wrong person. And I'm like, you should have thought of that way before because here you are. And what I know is that if you will not be immature and throw it away and actually work on it, you will eventually win because Jesus and love never fails. Amen? You're going to hear a lot about this next year. I'm going to be talking about life coaching next year and the fact that without discipline, you never get where you want to go. Too many people want it to be handed to them. I want somebody to hand me something. I want somebody to hand me uh, salvation, somebody to hand me uh, a good relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes work. And the only thing that's going to help you work through that is the peace of God. When God comes, he brings peace. And see, peace in your heart can bring peace in your relationship. See, a Savior can save us from the hostility that's in our own heart. The word for peace is God's kind inten intention. But let me give you a couple of thoughts about peace. First of all, the peace that the light brings is a condition. It's a condition. It is something that is happening inside of you. Too many of us think peace is comfort. I just want some peace. What you're saying is, I want everything to be going my way, and I want no resistance, and I want nothing pushing on me, and I want no problems in my life. I want everything in my life to be a certain way, and when it gets a certain way like that, then I will be at peace. Ladies and gentlemen, they have books like that in the fairy tale section of the bookstore. That is not real life. Peace is a condition that is inside of you. Tony Evans said this, peace is not the absence of trouble, 
but rather the presence of Jesus. I would say it like this. Peace is not necessarily comfort of circumstance, but a comfort of the heart. Do you guys remember the story of Jesus when he was on the lake and the storm was there and the disciples were afraid there was no peace in their heart, but Jesus was asleep? They woke Jesus up and Jesus calmed the storm and rebuked his disciples. He said, where's your faith? You see, when you have faith in the Messiah, the peace of the Messiah will come into your heart. Ladies and gentlemen who know Jesus, if Jesus is in the boat, the boat is not going down. And if Jesus is in your life, you cannot be destroyed because Jesus is Lord. Now, that's way better than that little hand clap, okay? Let's not patty cake today. Jesus is Lord. Come on, give him some praise. Amen? <laughs> Peace is not only a condition, it's conditional. Now, here's, here's a whole message wrapped up right here. This is my whole talk to you right now. The angel said peace on earth, didn't he? But yet we look around and we say we don't see much peace, do we? Does anybody remember the 60s and all the peace that was there? Y'all remember this? It's a joke, wasn't it? It really wasn't a joke. It was a bad time. We were protesting for peace by burning things down. Makes good, makes good sense. We used violence to bring peace. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, ever since then, we, we've not had peace. There's always been something in the world. Has there, let me ask you the question. Has there ever at any time been peace on earth? Think about it. Can you think? Well, what did the angel say? He said, here's the Messiah, peace on earth. Ah, there's a condition. He said, peace on earth to whom God's favor rests. There's your condition. Too many entitled people in our world just want peace to just happen. I just want to, you know. Every time somebody says that, the first thing out of their mouth is, I just want. You've got something wrong in here. Too many of us is looking for the world to bring our peace. We want people at work to straighten up. We want people in government to straighten up. <laughs> Good luck with that. Right? But we can't demonize them. You know why our country is the way it is? It falls right here, guys. Yeah. Those people represent us. And the church is in the world. We are to be instruments of peace in the world, right? The world is trying to bring peace, and the world aims at peace, but they don't want to use the Prince of Peace. The enemy attempts to bring peace. The world system wants to bring peace through things like positive tolerance. Like, there's a thing now where we just need to tolerate everything and every belief system and everything that comes, up, comes out, comes down from political correctness is what we have to tolerate. Don't think so. Man-made principles of morality. The Supreme Court has the right to decide what is right and wrong. Moderating holiness. Holiness is not a standard anymore. There's a lot of people that are making the claim that they are Christian and they're talking in a way and they live lives that do not denote holiness. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says without holiness, no one will see God. Compromising truth. You ever heard somebody say, well, you're one of those Bible thumpers. You believe those old things about marriage and stuff. And I'm like, yep. <laughs> Jesus said, if you believe the words that I say, you're never going down. United States has been here over 200 years. I don't know how much long she has, but I tell you what, the church will never go out of business. Is that right? Amen. Worldly unity. The enemy promotes unity, but the enemy's unity is only a disguise for slavery. Because the only way the enemy in the world system can bring about peace is through enslaving its people and taking away any of your choices. The world believes that unholy living will produce peace. That's crazy. That's an, un, uh, that's an oxymoron. The modern religious person's way to peace is to compromise our beliefs, compromise our practice, and moderate the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, it just can't be. 
Even the Apostle Paul said that the world system was going to aim at peace. In 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, Brothers and sisters, about the times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying what? Wow. Destruction will come on them suddenly. Kind of like the suddenly that the light came on the shepherds. Can I say something to you? 2018's over. You got a week left. You got a week left to do all of those resolutions that you decided last January. I don't know what's going to happen in 2019, do you? Do you know whether or not you're going to be alive next year? Do you know whether or not Jesus is going to return next year? We don't any of us know that. So how can we live with that kind of knowledge? I mean, what can we do? The only thing that can save us from that anxiety and fear is the peace of God. And it says to those on whom his favor rests, ladies and gentlemen, God's favor is called grace. You put faith in Jesus Christ, he'll give you his grace and he'll give you his peace. Let me describe peace to you first. Peace comes when we relate right to authority. When we relate right to the authority, who is the authority? Jesus is Lord. I'll give you real quick a story about what happened to me last week in Mexico. I was privileged to be able to sit on the international bridge at crossing between uh, Nuevo Laredo and Laredo, Texas, and, and uh, on my tablet watching the service from there last week, and it was, it was great. And uh, the team did a great job. Pastor Blake was just preaching uh, just the word of God. It was a great time. And I was coming back from a long week, a lot of driving. And, and uh, when I went across the border to get into Mexico, I'll make the long story short, I had eight bags, garbage bags full of blankets and coats to take the children in La Isla, our mission. Eight bags, big thing. I drove with my suitcase in the front seat. Pastor Salo, the missionary, came across the border. We loaded everything into his car. He and I are sitting in the front, and he's got bags piled up so you can't see through the back window. And what I know about the immigration in Mexico is they don't like for you to bring stuff like that across the border. So I'm a little anxious. Do you understand why? So, and, and think about it. I'm in a car, and there's all this stuff back here. I mean, what does it look like? You know, I mean, I, Jim, I have no idea what's about to happen. So we go in, we take the bridge number, number one, the old bridge. Maybe they won't be so crowded. Maybe they'll just let us go. No, they saw us. They waved us over, put us over to the reviewing stand and said, what have you got in the back? And it's like, oh, we've got some blankets, coats. We're going to give some, some children. They came from the church. We had a form filled out. It's a donation. And the guy says, no. You're bringing in stuff that's old and bad, and you cannot do that. And Salo's like, no, uh, this is donated from a church. And he says, well, then where is the ticket that shows where they were bought? And Salo says, no, they're donations. You don't understand. They're giving them to our, to our children. It's for the children and everything. And the officer said, no, I'm going to have to look through everything, pull over, and we'll look through it. So I'm like thinking, oh, okay, we're going to do this. And there's another thing that I have to do when I go to Mexico. I have to get legal permission. It's called a visa. When people come to our country, they are required to have a, a visa to be into our country. When I go to another country, I have to have a visa from their country. The immigration office is right there. So I'm supposed to get out at the reviewing stand, walk in, get my permission, pay 25 bucks, get my permission, come back. And by the time they get through, maybe we, we might have to leave the stuff, whatever, but then we'll go on to our destination. So... I'm thinking, okay, we're going to pull over to another review stand, and I'm going to get out of the car and go do this. But Salo, when the man said pull over, he said, yes, sir, Salo just drove off. Uh, Salo. Uh, Salo, they, they're going to they're gonna know. <laughs> That's a first. 
30 miles out, or 30 kilometers out, is another immigration checkpoint. Oh, great. I can just see it. The guy coming up with a machine gun, Mr. Anderson, where's your, uh, where's your papers? Oh, I had an answer. I, well, I'm not going to tell you what I was going to tell him. Got to the checkpoint. They just didn't even look at us. We just drove by. And for three, two days, I was in Mex Mexico with no legal permission. <laughs> I was illegal. I'll go ahead and tell you. If they stop me, I was going to say, I, is this Tijuana? <laughs> no Spanish. <laughs> and then sometimes coming back, I'm on a bus, right? Nobody's there with me. And sometimes when we get to that checkpoint, the officer comes in and looks at your papers. So I decided I was going to pretend to be asleep. So we got to the checkpoint. I was watching the preaching anyway, so it worked out. We just drove right by it, got to the bridge. You know, here's what I learned. I was not in compliance with the authority, and I, I lacked a little peace. Do you understand that? You know why you don't have peace with God? Because you're not relating right to his authority. Jesus is Lord. That's simply that. Peace comes when we relate right to authority. Peace comes when we have a right understanding of reality. Here's the, here's the reality today. We're here today, and life is not about us. Life is about Jesus. Everything about you, your job belongs to Jesus. Your marriage belongs to Jesus. Your church belongs to Jesus. And he gives us the privilege of enjoying his things. So guess what? No matter what happens, Jesus is Lord. That's reality. The last part that I would say, peace is also... A, the rule of God internally. When you have the peace of God, then you don't really have to worry so much about your circumstances. I'll close with this story. My friend's name was Dennis. I knew Dennis about 10 years ago after I met him in the Potosi Correctional Center in Potosi, Missouri. Dennis had done some very bad things in his life. He had been convicted of murder. In the state of Missouri, he was sentenced to die. And in Missouri, in the prison system, the death row inmates can be in the general population if they behave themselves, and Dennis did, because here's what happened to Dennis. Dennis received Jesus Christ as his Savior. And what happened to Dennis was he was given the peace of God. He was a person of peace inside that prison. I want to tell you this. I've been pastoring a long time, and I doubt if I, someone would ask me the top five spiritual people I've met in my life, Dennis Skillicorn would have been one of them. He was like the Apostle Paul inside that prison, and yet he was on death row. Every day of his life, he knew that the, the officers could come and handcuff him and take him to Von Terre Prison to, where they execute, put him in a cell for 30 days, and then put the needle in his arm. He knew that every day. One day it happened. They came to him. They, they arrested him again. Took him to Bon Terre, And for 30 days, he spent 30 days there waiting his execution. You know, one day I picked up the phone. It was, it was ringing. It, it had a Missouri prefix. I answered the, the phone, and it was Dennis. I said, how you doing? He said, man, I'm just taking care of God's business. You know what he was doing in the prison? You know what he was doing while he was waiting execution? He was writing letters to the prison church encouraging the men that were in that prison. Now, how do you do that? How do you do that when you know you're about to die? How do you live like that when you don't know that at any moment it could be your last? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we live that way right now. We don't know when our last day is. But I can tell you what you can have. You can have the peace of God that passes all understanding as you receive Messiah in your life. It's the rule of God over your heart. Dennis never did lose it. And as they were putting the needle in his arm, he was still testifying to the grace of God. That could be you. Not the prison part. <laughs> 
Well, if you insist, you could probably do that too. <laughs> but the peace is available to you. And when the light comes, the light brings purpose, the light brings peace, and the light brings praise. People who have the peace of God praise God. The angels said glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And ladies and gentlemen, the praise started in heaven. The peace came to the shepherds. And guess what the shepherds said? In verse 20, I think it's verse 20, the Bible said that the shepherds began to praise God. They returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. I want you to know today that everything God tells you is true. And if you will give your life to Jesus today, follow the light, come to the light, give your life over to Jesus, he will save you, he'll give you purpose, he'll give you peace, and the praise will come out of your mouth. That is available to you today.